So in this week's lecture, we're going to cover polymers, which are used in a wide variety of biomaterial applications. In fact, polymers represent the largest class of materials used in medicine today. We're going to cover a basic overview of polymers. We're going to get into the molecular architecture, molecular weight, and chemical composition, and specifically those that directly affect the structure property relationship of polymers. So ones that link the chemical properties with the physical properties on a macroscopic scale. In the second half of the lecture, we'll cover three specific polymers that are widely used in biomaterials, although certainly not an extensive list, and there are many polymers as we're going to learn about throughout the course. I was going to try and avoid the generic Webster's Dictionary defines polymer as, but I really think it's the best way to get into it. Um, polymer comes from the Greek root words poly, meaning many, and mer, meaning part. So polymers are just made up of repeating subunits that derive from monomers, the original mer part. In fact, the hallmark of polymers is their high molecular weight. So if you consider the molecular weight of something like water, which is only 18 Daltons, and then a typical polymer might be 200,000 Daltons. And it's this possibility to have thousands and thousands of repeating units that make it possible to have such a high molecular weight, something that would not be seen in nature with other kinds of materials. Now, the simplest way polymers can be organized is in a simple linear chain, just going in one direction, one after another. A more complex pattern might be in the form of a branch chain, where the backbone of a polymer might have reactive groups that can then further polymerize and go off in multiple directions as opposed to a single linear line. Even more complex patterns can emerge from the cross-linking of either branched or even linear polymer networks um, to form a network polymer. And it's this cross-linking of independently formed polymer chains that can form highly complex polymer networks. Furthermore, polymer chains don't need to consist of the same repeating unit, like in the case of a homopolymer. They could also consist of two separate linear chains that are bonded together in the form of a block copolymer, which have their own separate sections. A randomized copolymer, on the other hand, are ones that have different repeating subunits randomly mixed in with each other. Different subunits could still be mixed in with each other, but in a very organized alternating fashion, like in this ABA format. We could also have graph copolymers, which are different linear chains that are cross-linked on the backbone of one another. And note that all these structures can be further extrapolated when incorporating third polymer chains, fourth polymer chains, so the combinations are really limitless. Now, as I said before, polymers are created through the polymerization of low molecular weight parts called monomers. And it's the degree of polymerization that determines how many repeating units there are in a single molecule. So think of this as like the extent of a reaction. So you could either have a short reaction that just create a small polymer, or you could allow that reaction to continue and continue. And as long as you don't stop it, you can, in theory, make an infinitesimally large polymer. Although logistically and in practice, there are a lot of things that would prevent that from happening. Now, when we're trying to do this, we can never just focus and create one molecule per reaction, right? So we're always making millions and trillions of different molecules at a given time. And because we can't precisely control the degree of polymerization with each molecule, we're always going to have a heterogeneous mix of polymers with different molecular weights and different degrees of polymerization. So we need to characterize the molecular weight never of a single molecule, but of the entire heterogeneous mixture of, that, of those polymers. We do so by describing the average molecular weight. Except whenever we talk about an average, we have to consider what frame of reference we're using or how it's weighted. And polymer scientists use two ways to consider the average molecular weight and the frame of references. One is termed the number average molecular weight. The other is the weight average molecular weight. Number average, I think, is a little bit more simpler for people to interpret because it's more related to the typical mean or average that we've used since grade school. The weight average molecular weight is calculated using the square of the molecular weight in the numerator. So it's always more biased and heavily favored towards the larger molecules in a reaction, even if there are fewer. An analogy I like to use in this case is that if you have a mixture of balls consisting of 10 golf balls and one basketball, and someone asks you what's the average size of these, you would have to ask yourself how you account for the very large basketball as the outlier of the group. If you were to just add up all 11 balls 
and add up their diameters and divide it up by the number of balls, you would get a number very close to the golf ball because there's so many of them in comparison to the basketball. However, if you were to factor in and weigh it towards the diameter of the balls and include that in the numerator, then you're going to see the effects of that basketball in the mix. And for whatever application, whatever reason is why you're counting these up, that might be necessary to take into account. And as you can see by the two equations, the weight average molecular weight, or the diameter of the basketball in the analogy, um, is going to always result in a larger number for the weight average as opposed to the number average. Then, to get a sense of the distribution of molecular weights in a given sample, or the heterogeneity of your molecular weights, you can calculate what's called the polydispersity index, which is the spread of the different polymerization degrees. And it's calculated using the weight average molecular weight divided by the number average molecular weight. And because the weight average is always going to be larger than the number average, the scale of this number goes from 1, indicating a completely uniform and homogeneous mixture of polymers that all have the same molecular weight, to potentially infinity if you have a large spread of molecular weights. Today, the most common way of measuring polymer molecular weights and the polydispersity is to use gel permeation chromatography, or GPC. This form of chromatography separates compounds by molecular weight so that large molecular weight compounds come out of a GPC column first and they get detect detected and then smaller ones come out later and they get detected. The result of this is a curve like shown here on the slide where you know the count of how many particles of a particular molecular weight come out because you compared it to some standards curve and because you have the number of each size of compound that comes out you can use those inputs of the two equations from the previous slides and then also get the polydispersity. So now we've talked about the molecular weight and chain architecture of polymer. We want to start relating how these chemical features can make up the macromolecular behavior, like strength. Okay, because this is one of the key design features that we would need to take into account when making a biomaterial. If we were to make a bone cement, for instance, we have to ensure that the material is both strong enough to act as a cement, but not so brittle that it would just fail due to low fracture toughness. Much of this physical behavior is dependent on the physical state of polymers, which can be classified in two different ways. One would be an amorphous state, and then the opposite of that would be a crystalline or highly organized state. An amorphous polymer is one that has molecules found in unorganized random orientations that are highly interpenetrated with neighboring molecules. An amorphous polymer can be further subcategorized into either a rubbery or a glassy state depending on how much thermal energy it has. If an amorphous polymer has been melted to the point where it has enough thermal energy for rotations around single bonds to occur, so it makes it soft, flexible, and extendable, we would say that it's in the rubbery state. Below a certain temperature, the polymer lacks the ability to rotate around its single bonds. In this case, it forms a rigid and also stronger structure known as a glassy state. The temperature that divides these two is the glass transition temperature. Now, as your college students and no doubt very familiar with ramen noodles, you're already very familiar with this transitioning pattern. At a low temperature below the glass transition temperature, these noodles are a solid brick and while very strong, are also very brittle so that you can actually very easily break them. However, when you heat them above their glass transition temperature, they turn back to a rubbery state and they're very flexible, very soft, it's hard to break them in half unless you can really pull them and get a good grip on them. So I think this illustrates the behavior very well of uh, the difference between a rubbery and a glass state. Now the opposite of an amorphous structure, which again is an unorganized random orientation of polymer structures, would be a crystalline state, where the polymers form rigid and very organized lattice structures. Now in practice, it's very difficult and almost unfeasible to get an entire polymer structure into a crystalline state, and furthermore, Many complex polymers only have the ability for some of their regions to form lattice structures while other areas can't. Therefore, we usually say that some polymers with organized structures are in a semi-crystalline state, where only portions of those polymers capable of forming the lattice structures are formed. Now, these crystalline regions can be broken down by heating the polymer above its crystalline melting point, Tm. Now, the Tm is always well above the glass transition temperature, so polymers can go through a variety of these temperature transition points, which progressively bring them into stronger and more organized patterns. 
Because of this, biomedical engineers are very interested in these temperature transition points, specifically how close they are to body temperature for those biomaterials that are going to interact with the body. The two most common ways of determining these temperature transition points are through differential scanning calimetry, or DSC, and dynamic mechanical analysis, or DMA. In DSC, a similar polymer sample is heated or cooled at a constant temperature rate. The amount of heat supplied or removed is then recorded. And then the step change of the temperature of the sample versus the heat supplied can indicate whenever these transition points have occurred. So like in the graph shown below, we have the heat supply on the y-axis, the temperature on the x-axis, and we can see the various plateaus or step changes that indicate whenever one of these temperature transitions has occurred. The other method, dynamic mechanical analysis, I sometimes see dynamic thermal analysis as well, DTA, um, measures the mechanical stiffness or modulus of a polymer sample over a temperature range. When heating a semi-crystalline polymer, the stiffness or modulus will first drop significantly, almost three orders of magnitude, first when reaching the glass transition temperature, and then finally the melting temperature that disrupts and gets rid of all the crystalline structures in that polymer, making it completely amorphous and rubbery again. Finally, the physical properties of a polymer may change over time, especially in the body, depending on whether or not the polymer is biodegradable or biostable. Now, which one of these cases we want depends on the application of that particular polymer. If we want a load-bearing implant that's meant to last for decades or for the lifetime of a patient, we want a biostable polymer that isn't going to degrade over time. However, if we want to engineer, say, a tissue scaffold that over time gets replaced by the healthy cells of the body during like a wound repair process, then we want something that is biodegradable, preferably on the same time length as the wound healing process. Now, the main type of polymer degradation occurs via hydrolysis, which is the breaking of bonds via water. The stability of that is dependent on two factors. The first being water absorption, which is how readily water can interact and get to the polymer. And then the second is the susceptibility of those various chain bonds uh, to hydrolysis. Both of these stability factors can influence various polymers in different ways. For instance, nylon 6.6 somewhat has an ability to absorb water. It's not exactly a hydrophilic polymer, but it does allow water absorption. However, the amine bonds in nylon 6.6 have a very low susceptibility to hydrolysis. In fact, while they do hydrolyze, um, it occurs over such a long period of time that on a given lifetime of a patient, we would consider this polymer biostable. PL PLGA, on the other hand, polylactic co-glycolic acid, is made up of both hydrophilic glycolic monomers and then hydrophobic lactic acid monomers. And the degree of these can change the water absorption, but in general, most 50-50 random mixtures of PLGA have a relatively low water absorption rates, but because their susceptibility of hydrolysis is on the medium or actually relatively high scale, uh, these can be considered biodegradable over the lifetime of a patient. So PLA could, for instance, last a few years, maybe not for load-bearing applications, whereas PGA polymers that are only made up of the more hydrophilic glycolic acid monomer uh, would degrade very rapidly. And a lot of these components can be used in sutures or other applications where we want the polymer to degrade within a very short time frame. On the other hand, PET has some of the same ester bonds that are found in PGA and PLGA. Despite this, however, the hydrophobic nature of the polymer and also the fact that it's always found in a highly crystalline state makes it so not susceptible hydrolysis that's considered stable. Now moving on to some specific polymers, the first one I'm going to touch on is polyurethane. In industrial setting, polyurethanes are used in a wide variety of adhesives, coatings, sealants, rigid and flexible foams, and textile fibers. However, it's due to their excellent mechanical properties, stability, and great biocompatibility that gives them a special place in medicine, where they have a wide variety of applications like artificial pacemaker lead insulations, catheters, vascular grafts, heart assist balloon pumps, artificial heart bladders, and wound dressings. Part of their extreme versatility comes about due to how they're synthesized and then conjoined together. In fact, most polyurethanes these days are combinations of different polyurethane chains in the form of block copolymers or uh, polymer networks that gives them a variety of different properties on the macro scale that are in fact made up of different nano properties on the micro scale. 
They could have long flexible segments that are then soft and elastic. Cross-linking of these segments then gives the entire polymer a tough and rigid feel. Long chains, low cross-linking can make them stretchy. We can also have short chains with high degrees of cross-linking that makes it hard and tough, even brittle. Long chains with an intermediate amount of cross-linking can be used in foaming applications. And then lastly, we can determine their entire 3D structure through the degree of cross-linking that we allow. Now, polyurethanes were first synthesized in 1937 by a German chemist named Otto Beyer in Leverkusen, Germany. Bea, or Bayer, was the founder of the chemical company of the same name. And if you're a soccer fan, you might even recognize the German soccer team, Bea Leverkusen, which started as just a intramural team of uh, workers at the factory. But back to polyurethanes. They later gained widespread use during World War II when rubber was hard to come by. It would later be used in adhesives, elastomers, and a lot of foams due to its ability to be expanded. Um, flexible cushing foams including. Um, and then by the 1960s to our present day, we're found in many a host array of uh, uses in, in our everyday lives. In biomedical applications, polyurethanes were famously used in the first artificial heart in the 1960s, which we'll go into more detail in just a second. In the 1970s, polyurethane was introduced as an insulator for pacemaker leads, which were gaining widespread adoption at the time. Um, in the 1990s, they were then used to make catheters, Catheters say just by sheer number are the most widely used biomedical device. And then in the 2000s, more recent advances in artificial heart technologies like the Circadia Art Total Artificial Heart in 2004 were developed using polyurethanes. Now because polyurethanes have such a strong link with the history of artificial hearts, I want to go into that in a little bit more detail. So in 1969, the first implantation of a polyurethane artificial heart that was developed by Domingo Laureate in Houston, Texas, was implanted into a Texas patient by the name of Haskell Carp. Now, Carp only had the artificial heart in for 64 hours. It's meant to be a, a bridge implant until he could get a donor heart. And unfortunately, he died soon after the rece receiving a real heart, most likely due to the immunosuppressants that were given to him. Next up came the Jarvik hearts, developed by Robert Jarvik, a very famous American biomedical researcher and scientist who first implanted his first iteration of the Jarvik heart into a man in 1982, which the man survived 112 days with. And in 1984, the man survived 620 days with the last model of the Jarvik series, the Jarvik 7. But yet, it wasn't until 1990 when the first FDA-approved device was implanted into a person. Now, before this, all the other artificial hearts mentioned here operated an, an almost dishwasher-sized pneumatic devices that had to be connected to the patient at the time. And all these patients were never discharged from a hospital. So it was a very big deal that in 1990, this first device that was implanted into a person, Brian Williams, was able to be discharged with the first approved um, device, known as a ventricular assist device in biomedical terms, as opposed to an artificial heart. The polyurethanes themselves express a number of distinct advantages compared to other polymers. One, they're impact resistant, they have fantastic blood compatibility properties, which makes them an excellent candidate for an artificial heart or ventricular assist device. Overall, they have great bio compatibility in general. They have a low coefficient of friction and low water permeability. They can withstand extensive wear and resist a lot of vibration. Because of that, they have excellent tear strength, elasticity, and electrical insulation, which is why they're used in the pacemaking leads. They can withstand a variety of temperature changes, and also they can be manufactured at a low cost. Some of the distinct advantages that are associated with polyurethanes is that the isocyanates that are used during the synthesis raise several toxicity concerns. They experience a lot of environmental stress cracking, which makes them not ideal for load-bearing applications. They do have the ability to degrade in vivo. The degradation can be accelerated or aggravated under certain conditions. And also they're susceptible to what's known as metal ion oxidation, or the other mechanisms through which polymers can degrade, and which we'll get into in more detail in later chapters. The next set of polymers we're going to talk about are silicones, which have a rich history in biomedical devices and biomaterials. Now, silicones aren't a single polymer, but a family of organic silicon-based polymers that have not just silicon in them, but more specifically alternating silicon and oxygen atoms in the backbone chain. The name silicones is itself derived from ketones, 
as on average, one silicone repeating branch will have one silicon atom, one oxygen atom, and then two methyl groups, just like a ketone. Now let me stress here some of the pronunciation. The element is silicon, the polymer is silicones, like ketones. So use that to help you remember. This ketone-like repeating unit that has two methyl groups is called siloxane, and it's the most basic repeating unit in terms of the silicone family. The polymer consisting of just siloxane is the most common silicone polymer, polydimethylsiloxane. From there, various silicone polymers are made by substituting these methyl groups with non-methyl groups along the backbone of the polymer. Due to the structure of silicones and the simultaneous presence of organic groups attached to an inorganic backbone, give silicones a unique combination of distinctive properties. One of the more notable properties being that they have long-term durability at both high and low temperatures. Because of this, they can be used in a variety of different applications like emulsions, resins, elastomers, gels, fluids, and pressure-sensitive adhesives. Now, the element silicon, despite being quite common, as it's the eighth most common element in the universe, and second most common in the very accessible Earth's crust, uh, is rarely found in its elemental form. Now, in the early history of humans, the most common use of silicon was used to make glass, but we still couldn't isolate the pure elemental form until 1824, when Jans Jakob Berzelius was first able to do it by the, using the reduction of potassium fluorosilicates with potassium itself. Thirty years later, French chemist Henri Sinclair de Ville discovered a synthesis method for pure silicon using high temperature electrolysis melting. Getting into the early 1900s, it was Frederick Stanley Kipping, who's known as the founding father of silicon science, began his career defining studies on silicon compounds, where he developed a number of synthesis methods for a lot of the silicone polymers that we know today. In fact, it was he who coined the term silicones. In 1935, a Harvard organic chemistry professor by the name of Eugene Rokoff was the first to use silicones as an electrically insulating material. Prior to this, insulating materials have had issues with stability at higher temperatures, and the results of using silicones was immediate. Even today, we continue to use silicone insulating materials in both aerospace applications and also biomedical applications like pacemaker leads. A few years later, Rokoff, together with Richard Muller, developed a method for synthesizing silicones on an industrial scale known as the direct process method, which paved the way for large-scale industrial use. And this direct process is the basis for all commercial production today used by, used by companies like GE and Dow Corning. Due to the popularity of this direct process, silicone polymers started to become mainstream, particularly in medicinal applications. Starting in 1946, methylchlorosilanes were used to prevent blood clots at at-risk patients. That same year, silicone elastomers started to be used in surgery to help drain blocked bile ducts. A few years later, a surgeon by the name of Robert Di Nicola started using the same silicone elastomers used in the duct therapy to produce a permanent artificial urethra. A very notable example of the use of silicones in medicine came in 1955 when Dr. Eugene Spitz, a surgeon working in Philadelphia, replaced the often failing and polyethylene-based shunt catheter materials used for the treatment of hydrocephalus with the silicone-based ones, which were wildly more successful. This pioneering work was done just down the street in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Continuing on, in 1968, Dr. Alfred Swanson developed silicon finger joint implants for the treatment of severe arthritis. Part of the reason for silicone success in medical applications is due to the number of advantages that these type of polymers pose. First and foremost is the fact that they have a low glass transition temperature. In medical applications, this ensures that silicones remain in the rubbery, amorphous state at body temperature, but also makes it very applicable to even aerospace applications where we have large swings of low temperatures and high temperatures, yet silicones can remain their ductility and their flexibility. Silicones also have great resistance to a number of environmental factors, which makes them relatively bioinert in the body. The low glass transition temperature also makes silicones very flexible at body temperature. Silicones also exhibit great blood compatibility, which makes them excellent uses in catheters. And they're also electrically insulating, as mentioned before in their popularity in the use of uh, pacemakers. And though the last one, the fact that they're non-flammable, renders itself more useful in industrial applications, it's still worth noting, even in the biomedical sense. However, silicones do pose a number of disadvantage. 
first and foremost is that they have a low mechanical modulus. So they're typically not used in weight bearing applications or any periods that receive high amounts of cyclic stress. I think a good application that illustrates this is their popularity in the use of finger joint replacements, though the low mechanical modulus makes some poor replacements for higher load bearing areas like hip joints, shoulders, or knee joints. Though silicones are bioinert, meaning that they don't elicit a strong immune response from the body, they are susceptible to certain degradation mechanisms, notably hydrolysis and also attacks by acids and bases. Another reason why they're not used in weight-bearing applications is their poor resistance to abrasion. Furthermore, silicones are relatively hydrophobic, which means that they'll easily absorb large amounts of proteins from the body. And those silicones are themselves bioinert. It's these proteins that the body recognizes, and this identifies the silicones as a foreign body. So the body starts encapsulating any silicone device, which a large amount of um, granulation tissue and scar tissue to sort of encapsulate those medical devices. Um, this is very common in breast implants. The last set of polymers I want to talk about are polyglycolic acid, polylactic acid, and their copolymers, known as POA, PGA, and PLGA. These groups of polymers are some of the most widely investigated and most commonly used synthetic and biorotable polymers. I have no doubt that most of you have heard of these polymers before. When I first started doing my graduate work, it was first with PLGA. If you do any kind of research in biomaterials, you're at least going to be aware of these polymers. I would say the two key traits of these polymers are first, their mechanical strength, and second, their ability to bio row. So there are a lot of applications that make use of these. The first totally synthetic and absorbable sutures were, for example, made out of PGA in the, in the 70s. And because we have the ability to time the degradation rates by altering the ratio of the lactic and glycolic monomers in these polymers, um, to coincide with the tissue rebuilding process, they're also popular in the use of tissue scaffolds for tissue engineering. We can also use them in drug release systems where the degradation of these polymers factors into the release of drugs. They'll also be used in bone fixation devices. Now beyond medical applications, they're also widely used in industrial applications where you want something that's both disposable and environmentally friendly. So packaging material and disposable tableware are often made of these polymers. Um, they're used widely in 3D printing as a filament or a resin, and then even some applications like upholstery. Now, the monomers for these polymers and also the resulting byproducts of the biodegradation of these polymers are lactic acid and glycolic acid. Both these monomers belong to a group of compounds known as alpha hydroxy acids, which by definition are a compound with a carboxylic acid end group and then a hydroxyl group on an adjacent carbon. Now, the reason that the polymers are so popular is not just due to the fact that they're biodegradable, but the fact that the degradation products are so well tolerated by our body. In fact, we make these as part of our own natural biosynthesis processes. Lactic acid, for instance, is produced during the breakdown of glucose. For this reason, alpha hydroxy acids are widely used not just in pharmaceutical industries, but the cosmetic industry as well. Both glycolic acid and lactic acid are commonly used in facial cleansers, and anti-wrinkling creams because their ability to break up loose skin on the surface, in addition to some other AHAs like citric acid, malic acid, tartaric acid, which is derived from grapes, and so on. Both of these monomers and alpha hydroxy acids in general fall under a general ester bond description, which is just a carboxylic acid and an alcohol linked together on adjacent chains. So the backbone is really just repeating units of oxygen, an oxygen group, and then a carbon group that has a double bond oxygen coming off of it. Glycolic acid is the simpler of the two because that adjacent carbon atom simply has another hydrogen coming off, or sorry, two hydrogen coming off, whereas lactic acid has a methyl group coming off the backbone. It's because of that methyl group off the lactic acid that lactic acid-based polymers are more hydrophobic as opposed to the more hydrophilic glycolic acid, which just has the hydrogen groups coming off. To synthesize these polymers, it's possible to undergo a dehydration reaction, which is simply just the combination of a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, which produces that ester bond and leaving water to come off. And this actually illustrates the hydrolysis degradation of these polymers as well. It's just the reverse reaction of this. However, most production means of producing POA, PGA, or the copolymers are the result of what's called a ring opening copolymerization. So this is where you have a molecule like glycolide 
or lactide, which is a cyclic monomer, and then you break open that cyclic chain to produce the backbone of the, uh, of the polymer itself. This slide, I think, better demonstrates the backbone structure of both the single polymers and then their copolymer structure. So again, polylactic acid has the methyl group coming off the carbon, whereas polyglycolic acid just has the two hydrogens coming off that single carbon chain, making it the simplest of the alpha hydroxy acid polymers. Because of the two opposing water attraction properties of these two monomers, we can actually create copolymers that have varying degrees of hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity, depending on the ratio of those two monomers within the polymer backbone. Now in the history of these polymers, their monomers have been well known for a few centuries. In fact, lactic acid was first really discovered and synthesized in the late 1700s. But for the polymer form in polylactic acid, uh, it wasn't until 1932 where Wallace Carruthers, who was working at DuPont and who coincidentally also founded nylon, uh, first created and synthesized the polymer PLA. And as they refined their techniques in the later decades, in 1954, they started producing higher molecular weight PLA on the order of the polymers that are used today in medical devices. In 1966, an army medical researcher by the name of Kilkarni at Walter Reed Medical Center was the first to describe the applications of POA in a biomedical application, in this case for slowly degrading sutures. Finally, in 2002, the FDA categorized POA as generally recognized as safe, a label applied to materials that have been widely researched and so is exempted from typical food additive tolerance requirements established by the FDA. PGA, independent of POA, was first synthesized in 1954 but it wasn't until 1962 when it was first marketed as Dexon as a suture material. As you know, a suture has become a running theme in this particular polymer, because in 1974, PJ was combined with POA as a copolymer to make a composite known as Vicro, again used as a suture material. A decade later, in 1987, PJ was synthesized using what is now the dominant form of production for PGA and POA, of using a ring opening polymerization. Again, that's where you take a molecule like lactide or glycolide, which is cyclic, and you open the ring, thus creating the backbone for that particular polymer. Now, as both research and commercialization of PGA and POA increased, researchers started toying around with the idea of incorporating both monomers into a single polymer system. And two researchers by the name of Cutright and Miller were the first to extensively categorize the rates of degradation of PLGA as a ratio of the lactide and glycolide content. Then, a few decades later, by the year 2000s, the FDA finally approved the first PLGA device for use in drug delivery systems. So now let's discuss some advantages and disadvantages of the different polymers and their copolymers. Starting first with polylactic acid, of the three polymer systems, PLA is the strongest of the three, showing the highest tensile strength of around 37 megapascals. POA also has a relatively low crystallinity, and conductivity is sort of on the medium to low end. It's non-conductive at room temperature, however it's heated, it does become conductive, which makes it ideal in the use of 3D printing. As I said before when discussing the structure of POA, the additional methyl group on the backbone causes it to be more hydrophobic and thus more stable against hydrolysis compared to PGA. So while this might be an advantage of something like a disposable fork, where you wouldn't want it dissolving the minute you put it in your mouth, it's actually a disadvantage in terms of our research and knowledge of PLA, pure PLA, in things like drug delivery systems. Because high molecular weight PLA can take, for instance, more than five years to completely be reabsorbed in vivo. On the opposite end of the spectrum, PGA has almost all the opposite properties as POA. The tensile strength of pure PGA is much lower than both POA and their copolymers, so in this case the tensile strength on the order of 0.7 megapascals. It has a high crystallinity, remember POA has low crystallinity. It is conductive, even at room temperature, and it's hydrophilic as opposed to the hydrophobic POA. So in this case, an advantages can be the rapid degradation of PGA, which makes it ideal for short-term use, like dissolvable stitches, which themselves don't require a high tensile strength. Now, in fact, degradation can be so rapid that this can be disadvantageous for applications like tissue engineering, where because of the bulk hydrolysis of a relatively large implant, 
um, might produce carbon dioxide and other acidic byproducts that lower the pH, resulting in tissue inflammation or possibly even necrosis. Now, PLGA can often be thought of as a combination of both the advantages of PLA and PGA separately. The mechanical strength, while not linear in terms of its LA to GA proportions, does fall between both the tensile strength of pure PLA and PGA. So in this case, I think a 50-50 mixture makes a 17 megapascal tensile strength. Crystallinity can actually fall somewhere in the middle, although it's interesting, depending on the, the ratio of the two monomers, um, lactic acid can inhibit the, crystallation, the crystallization of glycolic acid um, at very specific ratios, like a 50-50 mixture of the two monomers somehow makes the glycolic acid completely unable to crystallize. And this is actually what makes an exception to the um, degradation rates of PLGA, in that a 50-50 mixture of the two has the fastest degradation rate, even more so than PGA by itself. Um, but for some reason, all other ratios of the two monomers allow PGA to crystallize, thus protecting it from degradation a bit more um, than the other monomers, or sorry, than the other polymer systems themselves. PLGA has a high melting point and also um, a relatively high conductivity, although usually for electrospinning purposes, it's usually combined with carbon nanofibers. Now, just like PLA and PGA, PLGA has been extensively researched and characterized. It's recognized as safe by the FDA. And more importantly, the mechanical properties and also degradation properties um, can be tuned by altering the ratio of the uh, lactic acid monomer and the glycolic acid monomer. And again, just to highlight the notable exception is the 50-50 ratio of PLGA. So if you had to draw a graph of polymer stability as a function of the lactic acid percentage in this copolymer, 0% being pure PGA, it would start off as not stable, meaning it degraded fast. And then there also be this linear line going up to 100% PLA, except for right when you get to the 50-50 mark, it would drop dramatically, even to the point where it's less stable than PGA itself, and then increase back up to that line and then continue onwards. Now, there are some general disadvantages of both polymers and their copolymer systems. Probably the biggest one being that um, cells just don't like adhering to them. So as much as we like their mechanical properties and their degradation rates, that would sound like a great application for tissue engineering scaffolds where we want cells to infiltrate and then grow. Cells just don't like adhering to them. And cells need to adhere something in order to signal proliferation and production of more cells. And second, even though their degradation products are native to the body and are produced endogenously, um, they're relatively strong acids, both lactic and glycolic acids. So if you have a rather large implant that remains somewhat localized in an avascular site, it's going to produce potentially a delayed inflammatory response that could be observed for months or even years afterwards, depending on how much lactic acid or how stable that particular polymer is. And that's it for this week's lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to get into metals, pyrolytic carbon, and also ceramics. And that kind of rounds out our materials used in devices mini track. Thanks.